Welcome everyone to this evening's uh, American Sheep Industry Association webinar, Reducing Labor at Lambing Time. My name is Jay Parsons. I'll be your host and moderator this evening. Very pleased to have with us this evening uh, Philip Berg and Mike Kasky, Pipestone Lamb and Wool Program Instructors at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the American Sheep Industry Association Rebuild the Sheep Inventory Committee for providing sponsorship funding for this evening's presentation and encourage all of you to uh, visit the American Sheep Industry Association website at sheepusa.org. I'd also like to let all of you know that this evening's program is being recorded and will be available for later viewing. Um, and you can find a link to it in all of our uh, previous webinars along with a lot of other uh, useful information on the Rebuild the Sheep Inventory uh, website which is growourflock.org so I encourage you to visit that also. Uh, we will have a uh, question and answer session um, at the uh, about the last 20 minutes of this evening's presentation. We are scheduled to go uh, about an hour and 15 minutes so uh, about 50 minutes from now we'll launch into a Q&A session. Uh, you um, can type questions into your question box that you have there on your uh, control panel uh, throughout the presentation and, and also during the Q&A session and we'll weed through those that way. Uh, there is also the option when we reach that point that you can uh, raise your hand and if you have a microphone connected to your computer I can unmute your microphone and you can actually uh, speak directly to our presenters and ask your question that way. So with that, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started on uh, this evening's webinar, Reducing Labor at Lambing Time. We're very pleased to have with us uh, Philip Berg and Mike Kasky. Of course, the, the Pipestone Lamb and Wool Program has, has a tremendous reputation throughout the country, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation, as many of you are, I'm sure. So Philip, uh, I believe you're going first, so go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, just to give you a little history about myself, um, I grew up on a sheep farm here in Pipestone. Uh, Pipestone is located kind of in southwestern Minnesota. I've been with the Lamb and Wool Program since uh, 2005, and I've previously worked with the Extension Service in southwestern Minnesota, and I also worked out at the Hedinger Research and Outreach Center in Hedinger, North Dakota. I uh, would like to also thank ASI and Jay for conducting these webinars. I think that's an a great educational tool and allowing us time to share with you um, some sheep management information that has been successful for many Midwestern sheep producers. The first thing I wanted to talk about was just a little bit of the history of the Pipestone Lamb and Wool Program. Um, it was uh, established in uh, 1972, and so we're going on 40-some years. Um, and it was established with funds from the National Sheep Industry Development Board or SID, and the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, the purpose of the National Sheep Industry Development Board was to promote education and new technology uh, to improve sheep production in the U.S. Uh, the National Sheep Industry Development Board was uh, funded by the National Lamb Feeders and the National Wool Growers and the American Lamb and Wool Councils at that time. Um, the National Sheep Industry Development Board is more popularly uh, remembered as developing the SID Sheep Production Handbook, um, which many sheep producers use as a resource, and I'd highly recommend it's an excellent resource book. Um, the other things I wanted to mention was that the Pipes on Lamb and Wool Program's primary educational efforts is with a group of sheep producers who live within driving distance of Pipestone. Uh, we provide educational programs, uh, do farm visits, have farm workshops and tours uh, for those individuals and encourage sharing of ideas. Uh, for those that live outside of the area, we offer online and on-site educational programs and tours. And for more information, you sure can go to our website, which is listed on this, on this slide, which is pipestonesheep.com. So getting into the purpose of uh, this presentation is to provide some information or some ideas on low labor lambing practices that have been um, successfully used for many producers in this area. Um, we realize that our lambing environment is a little different um, than many of you in this webinar, but I um, hope you can implement some of the principles that we're going to discuss. Uh, I will start with uh, some of the housing requirements and move into the principles and flow um, through the lambing barn 
and later Mike will uh, provide some diagrams of lambing barns and discuss the flow through those lambing, lambing barns. Producers spend a lot of valuable time during lambing, feeding, watering, and bedding, and so we will also provide some pictures and ideas of ways to reduce some of the labor um, to accomplish these tasks and allow producers more time to tend to the newborn lambs. So to start off with, uh, on the housing standpoint, um, many of our producers in this area begin lambing in January, and we need to provide an environment so that the lambs will not chill down too quickly and allow enough time for us to intervene if ne needed. The reason we begin lambing in January is uh, the labor requirements uh, or the sheep complement their crop production enterprise, and so uh, they have some time available, and um, it allows for them to work together or for uh, the labor, uh, to share that labor resource. Um, it also allows for more groups of use to go through our lambing barns, um, and so we start in January and, and run different lambing groups, multiple lambing groups through those, those barns, and allows us to get our lambing done prior to that spring planting and capitalize on some late um, spring and early summer markets. We refer to warm housing. This is our in our lambing barns. Uh, we're looking at above freezing temperatures, trying to keep the lambing barns above freezing temperatures, um, which is more favorable and a better working environment to, to be working in. A well-insulated lambing barn requires minimum heat, if any, um, other than the heat produced from the shorn ewes that we put into that lambing barn. Uh, probably the biggest problem is ventilation, or this is the biggest thing that's overlooked. Um, simply closing up a building to maintain the heat is a huge mistake. Uh, without proper ventilation, you, um, you need the ventilation to provide that fresh air uh, to help remove moisture buildup, um, to dilute some of the airborne diseases and to control the temperatures ex extremes. And so obviously uh, ventilation is an important part of the housing uh, of your landing barn. Uh, some of the housing space requirements is the next thing that I just wanted to go through. And these come uh, from the Midwest Plan Service Guides, the Sheep Housing and Equipment Handbook. Um, and basically when we look at a dry U or a U, um, a pregnant ewe weighing that 150 to 200 pounds, uh, we're estimating about 12 to 16 square foot of building space is required. When we look at ewes and their lambs, um, we tend to use 20 to 25 square feet because we're looking at higher landing rates, and so we're using the higher end of, of that square footage. Um, in either case, if we start to uh, reduce that space area, um, we're probably going to run into more health-related issues, as well as, especially on the ewes and lambs, um, we're probably going to see more lamb injury occur as well. And so we use those as guidelines, um, and we probably push the bubble up on on the the one end a little bit, but um, but we try to use those guidelines when we're thinking about our housing for our sheep. Um, also, just listed on this table is that we. Um, look at about 1.5 to 2 square feet uh, of creek area for our, our lambs, for lamb. Probably the most important slide of the presentation is this one, and, and it, it's based on how we move sheep through the system, and it focuses on the short dis distance principle. And so uh, when we talk today and when you look, listen today and evaluate your own lambing facilities is what is the distance from your drop area to your lambing pens? What is the distance from your lambing pens into your grouping areas? Uh, the more distance that you, you have to move the sheep, the lambs, and the ewes, uh, the more time and labor it's going to require to move them. And so we want to critically or look at that, that distance and how we can move those animals and the flow through um, as easy as possible. And so as um, so when Mike uh, reviews different building layouts, I, I encourage you to think about this and evaluate the layouts that he's going to present based on that short distance principle. 
and we have many different producers that have uh, similar layouts, but no, no, or not all of the of the layouts are exactly the same, and um, they all have that principle in, ter in place in terms of that short distance principle. The last bullet that I have on this um, on this slide uh, refers to uh, the placement of artificial rearing area for your milk replacer lambs, and um, this should be an area located in a high traffic area where you're going to walk by on a routine basis so you can observe and train those lambs to nurse. And, and that becomes a labor issue because we need it in an area that we can quickly and easily access those lambs and help them get started. Now once we've started those milk replacer lambs and they, and they figured out um, uh, drinking, uh, we can move them into other housing, but initially we want them in a high traffic area so that we can quickly and easily um, just take a few moments to um, get them to start nursing. So uh, that, that one is also important in terms of reducing, reducing the labor. The next thing that I want to talk a little bit about is just some different watering, watering, the watering system um, and show you several different examples of pictures of um, the watering tubes. Um, and this is a practice that, that I think um, we implemented from out west. Um, and, and almost all of our producers have this in place. Um, and why is water important? Well, it's the most it's essential nutrient. And we want to provide that 24-7 um, in, in a clean format. And so we want it very available. Um, and this water tube helps us to do that. And it also helps us to reduce some labor. We can fill that up uh, once a every other day or once a day um, rather than having to do uh, fill multiple pails and, and um, this really has worked very well and provides a lot of fresh clean water to those you freshly born um, freshly uh, those newborn the ewes that have just given birth um, the concept that we start with a, a tube and we're looking at about a six inch diameter tube uh, that's what we would recommend. Um, you can use a four inch diameter tube or a larger diameter tube. The four inch diameter tube, once we cut the hole in the top, becomes um, doesn't have a lot of water holding capacity. And so uh, the six inch uh, probably works better in that regard. Um, the eight inch or larger diameter tubes um, can be used as well, um, but they, they can hold a lot more water and they are also going to have a lot more weight and are harder to um, hold up and and if they get contaminated uh, take a lot more to clean out. Um, when we talk about the height of the water tubes uh, we want them about 24 to 27 inches in height and that's going to vary based on the size of the sheep that you have. Um, we want to make that about as high as we can as long as the use can and drink water out of them, and um, and that's going to vary from sheep operation to sheep operation. The water opening on top, um, initially when we started doing this, we probably cut down on the sides, um, and if I can get, let me see if I can get a spotlight here. Here's our water opening. I'm highlighting our water opening here. Uh, initially, we probably cut down farther on the sides and um, learn very quickly that that um, reduced the volume of water that we would have in the water tube. And so now when we, we cut the openings, uh, we're trying to cut them fairly um, close to the top, um, fairly narrow up on the top, uh, providing enough area for that you to drink water, um, but reducing that area so that there's less risk of contamination. Um, I'll show you several different examples of uh, water tubes. This is just one that I, it's basically the tube is, is suspended uh, through some kind of H frame in this, in this diagram uh, where a bar underneath this water tube holds it and uh, we can attach a landing jug to the outside edge of this H frame. And so we can uh, quickly and easily add lambing jugs um, to this system. Right. 
So the next picture that I want to show you is uh, another example of um, a setup with a water tube in it. Uh, this is a double roll, and uh, Mike will show you some pictures of some double rolls, and so you have a little better idea of that. Uh, the water tube runs right down the middle, and two lambing jugs can drink. The use on each side of the on each side of the water tube can drink out of uh, the same hole in the water tube. Um, this one actually has two sections to it, where we have about eight lambing pens here in the front, and there's an additional six lambing jugs in the back. Um, two different water tubes. Uh, the reason that they put two different water tubes in here is so that um, the weight of that water tube or the just moving of that water tube was easier because it just wasn't so, quite so long. Because between lambing groups, uh, they would dismantle this, uh, this area and clean that out. And it would not take them very long to get that process done, um, but it's just easier to move around a shorter uh, water tube um, in this case. Uh, the water tube principle is very similar to the last, um, last diagram where we basically have an H-frame. This one is made out of wood and on the bottom underneath this water tube there's a board and that board can be used to level that so that we wouldn't have to have that water tube level. And um, underneath the water tube there's a, a wood barrier or a barrier so the lambs can't go over it or under it. Um, and then we have a barrier on top so that the lambs that are used can't go over the top. Um, and so this is a very common, um, common uh, format of how they're set up. Um, let's see if I can get to the next picture. Uh, the next picture is a, a similar setup. Uh, this is just has a wooden, rather than a wooden frame, it has a metal frame. Um, and H frame where the water tube can sit on. Uh, this individual has used it so that when he needs those lambing jugs, he'll attach those lambing jugs um, as needed. And the drop user could drink the water out of the water tube if they have access to the water tube until they filled up all the lambing jugs. Uh, he also has a barrier on the bottom and a barrier on top. Um, he has since since this picture, he's moved this top barrier, this top wood uh, barrier underneath and just bolted it underneath, which moved it about four inches below, uh, which um, he had a little bit of an issue with having too wide of an opening here initially. And he was trying to jump through there. Um, but similar concept, um, actually this water tube, rather than um, being pulled out uh, is actually suspended from the ceiling and so they just crank that up when they're done and are able to clean up underneath it and it works very well that way. Uh, this is the same concept and again you can see the cables this is, is done the same way uh, where they can pull this up um, to the ceiling. Um, the only difference here he has a barrier underneath, a barrier on top, uh, one opening for two pens uh, probably the only difference is they're using a stock eight panel type um, uh, lambing jug rather than a wood lambing jug. And so again, very similar, um, similar concept. But we have some that will put their water tubes up on the outside walls, and um, here's just some different examples. Um, probably, more, probably my least favorite one is uh, hanging it with chains. Um, there can be a lot of weight on in these water tubes, and so uh, that um, concerns me. But probably more importantly is that uh, the water tube is more likely to to move or twist and can get drained out. Um, but we do have a producer that's using that. Um, here over on the right-hand side, uh, this is a common format where he's got a metal bracket that runs along the wall and is bolted to the wall and underneath it has an L frame or a J frame that holds the water tube in place and then the lambing jugs are actually set over the top or through that. Uh, this works very good on the outside wall. Um, this is another picture uh, where they have it on the outside wall. Um, he has a kind of an H frame format um, which also allows him to put lambing jugs on, attached to that. He uses this as his drop area and then can quickly take a lambing panel off of the wall and attach it um, starting at one end 
and work his way down as he needs that. And that works so that it has water for the drop area as well as water in the landing jug. And so that works, works very well. Here's another diagram of a, lemon, or of a water tube on the outside wall, just a little different format. Uh, here he has his lambing jugs um, attached to a pole. Uh, there's sleeves on the lambing jug to allow uh, the lambing jug itself to be lifted up as the manure builds up in that lambing jug and then outside of the lambing jug pen area. And it also allows him to lift that up and to slide it together and push it up against the wall and so it takes up less space when he doesn't have lambs in the lambing jug. Again, the same concept as, as the other ones. The last slide that I have before I turn it over to Mike, um, just view some of the things that we have that we get questions on is, okay, how do we fill the, fill the, the um, water tube? Well, probably the most commonly done method is just drilling a small hole and putting a garden hose in there. Uh, we quickly learned that when the person that was in charge of filling the water tube needed to stay there until the end of filling the water because if you leave that, um, maybe the low spot is three jugs down and the water will drain into that jug until you realize you left it on and you can make quite a mess. And so generally, if we're using this when we fill the water tube, we use that time to kind of um, evaluate the lambs a little bit, but pretty much sticking with that water hose until it's full. Uh, another concept is just putting a, an elbow on the end of that water tube, uh, which also, uh, we just stick the garden hose into that elbow, and that works out very well. Um, this also can be used to turn, if you turn that upside down, it can be used to drain that water tube out as well. And so that works as two functions. Um, most of our producers in the wintertime, uh, because of our climate, um, even though we have inside lambing barns, uh, we do not use uh, floats. If they do use a float, they tend to hook it up to a hydrant um, at some point, do some chores, and then shut off the hydrant, uh, have it filled for the day, and unhook it um, from the, the hydrant just in case it would happen to freeze. Um, we, see the, um, we see the floats more commonly used when we're using them for our lambs uh, in our finishing barns, um, and that works as well, um, works as a good water source. The other way of cleaning them out is to use a churn cap at the end um, of our water tube, and that works very well, and that's probably the, one of the more common ways of, of draining the water if we need to clean clean the water sources off there. That works out pretty good. So with that, I think that's going to um, that's going to end my part of the presentation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to finish out the discussion. Um, with you today. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, hopefully, we've gotten this all switched over here. Uh, it's um, it's my pleasure. It's kind of like halftime here. So it's, uh, as we switch, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to talk to you a little bit and share a few ideas about uh, lambing barn layout and and uh, ways to efficiently uh, feed sheep in lambing barns. Uh, I, I have been with the Pipestone Lamb and Wool Program uh, just finishing my 38th year. Uh, I'm a third generation sheep producer and uh, grew up uh, doing everything the hard way, maybe not on similar to what a lot of you uh, are doing in your operations. And in Pipestone about uh, 
about 15, 20 years ago, uh, we had a lot of producers that wanted to expand their operations. And part of being able to expand was to be able to bring labor saving to, uh, to their operations. And therefore, it, it drove this whole uh, labor saving concept behind their sheep operations, of which lambing time is one of uh, the critical times uh, when we have a lot of intense labor that needs to be put into an operation. And so it is the one part that we're talking about tonight. And as we talk about Let's Grow uh, program, which has helped and sponsor uh, this webinar tonight, uh, part of growing and part of the one of the objectives of the program is saving lambs and, and uh, not only getting more lambs born, but getting more saved uh, uh, to uh, market time and, and lambing time then becomes a real critical time to do that. And, and the reason we talk about labor saving is that we want to use our labor and our skill uh, to save baby lambs, to get them off to a good start, uh, to be able to run more sheep through our facilities uh, with the same labor. And, and so the, con the things that Phil has talked about in terms of water tubes and some of our concepts I want to build on. Uh, to me, at lambing pen, uh, when we get used in the lambing pens, we, we'd like to not have to spend much time feeding, watering, uh, bedding uh, lambing pens, and spend our time focused on making sure lambs have gotten nursed up, that they're bonded to mom, that we're processing them, uh, getting them off to a good start in the world. And so everything that we do, we want to get as close to a no, uh, no labor input into those things as we possibly can. Each of you will have unique challenges in your operation, and, and like Philip stated earlier, there are no two operations uh, that are ever exactly alike. Uh, you have your given set of facilities and equipment and environment that you're dealing with. Uh, so uh, Phil has talked about easy watering systems. They definitely are very important uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to a lamb operation, uh, the one nutrient that sheep absolutely have to have is water, particularly after lambing. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we provide that and have it available at all times in a labor-saving format, which the water tubes give us. Then we have the other aspect of feeding the ewes in the lambing pens. And uh, this particular slide shows uh, a few hanging feeders. I think a few of the slides that Phil showed you a little bit earlier showed uh, some of this style of feeder as well. Uh, these feeders are designed uh, to help save feed. Uh, we also have the feeders uh, so we can access them without getting in the lambing pen to feed the ewe. It's a way to feed long stem hay and grain. And in some of these uh, particular feeders, uh, particularly the one that uh, this arrow is on right now, uh, has some capacity so that we can actually uh, uh, put uh, self feed uh, even though we have to put feed in every day, we can actually self-feed some types of feeds uh, in this particular box. And so uh, there are ways that we can take some of the feeding uh, out of uh, our system. In recent years, uh, this slide here shows uh, a couple ways that we feed sheep with uh, basically uh, we only have to put feed out uh, you know, every two, three, four days. Uh, uh, the slide uh, here that uh, on your left as you view your screen uh, really shows five gallon pails and these five gallon pails are filled with soybean hull pellets and dried distiller grain and uh, we can self feed those. We can go from whatever ration the ewes are on to, uh, to the ewes uh, going on these the minute they hit the lambing pen and a five gallon pail will hold enough feed to last uh, for four or five days. Uh, in the lambing pens, and so it's a it's a low cost way of of making uh, of feeding used in the pen, where we only have to put that feed out every uh, four days or so to feed the pen. The advantage soybean hulls and DDGs give us is that they are a low starch uh, feed. That therefore acidosis isn't an issue, and so we can we can get these used onto a, a diet such as that. Uh, right away. We also can do it with corn silage or uh, tub ground hay uh, with alfalfa pellets, a number of different feeds that we could work into a, a feeding system that then allows us to not have to worry about feeding the sheep every day as long as we keep those feeders full. And again, you see a water tube uh, in this picture. The picture on the right-hand side uh, uh, is a, 
a producer put together uh, his lambing pens, and this is actually a feed hopper here uh, that turns this into a self feeder. Uh, and again, self feeding soy bean hull pellets and dried distillers grains, which you may not have available to you. You certainly could do the same with alfalfa pellets and some other feeds that are safe to self feed the sheep. But the, this basically uh, feeds. You can see where the arrow is here. Uh, this is feed that's coming out of this bin and uh, is available for both lambing pens, uh, actually four different lambing pens because there's another bank on the back side. And so these ewes are able to, uh, to self-feed on, on this particular ration. This box up above, the hopper that holds the feed, uh, can hold about two weeks worth of feed. And so we all, the, the actual feeding of the lambing pens uh, needs to be just a matter of filling up uh, this box and uh, about every uh, 10 days to two weeks, depending on how full our lambing pens are. And therefore, it eliminates the need to be doing daily feeding in the lambing pens. Uh, now, in addition to the lambing pens, uh, you know, uh, we have the ewes that are in part of the drop group, which is uh, you know, leading up to the lambing pens, and then uh, ewes coming out of the lambing pens going into, into small grouping pens and then eventually moving on to larger groups, or, uh, pairs of ewes and lambs. Uh, we have used a number of different feeding systems. Uh, obviously the, the picture on the left hand side is a fence line feeding system uh, where the ewes are turned outside. Uh, we uh, can control the quantity of feed and the type of ration they get uh, on this system. Uh, that's one uh, that's an easy way to feed, in particular if you have large numbers, you can uh, you can feed with a tractor and a feed wagon, and uh, and you can feed a thousand ewes in in a half hour to an hour's time, and so it's a pretty easy low labor feeding system. Uh, the other system that gets used a lot uh, with smaller flocks, in particular, would be to self feed ewes, uh, or at least give them access to big round bales of hay, uh, which cuts labor out. But as you can see from looking at this uh, big bale feeder. Uh, we have a lot of waste. Uh, that's the one disadvantage of self-feeding big round bales of hay. Uh, some big bale feeders are better than others in terms of minimizing waste, um, but it is another method to reduce some labor uh, and, and to allow us to focus on ewes that are lambing in their drop group, ewes in the lambing pens, and, uh, and then ewes when they come out, out of the lambing pens. Uh, we could focus on lamb care, lamb observation, uh, and those types of things which are going to pay us dividends in terms of lamb survival. Uh, the bottom picture uh, shows a cell feeder, and, and these types of cell feeders can be used a lot of different ways, but uh, in recent years we have more and more of our producers in this area that as they've expanded and increased their U numbers, uh, they use these feeders uh, to self-feed soy hulls and DDGs to use the first 30 days of lactation. Uh, the ewes do overconsume on that particular diet, uh, and so we don't want to be on it any longer than we have to, but uh, if we have enough of these feeders uh, to match our ewes, we really only have to fill these feeders about every two weeks. Uh, and so as far as feeding the ewes that are raising their lambs the first 30 days of lactation, uh, basically, you know, we we don't have to feed them. The feed is there in front of them all the time, and we can spend our time again on observing and looking for starve out lambs or lambs with health problems and so on. So it takes a tremendous amount of labor out of uh, out of our feeding system, and therefore uh, we can again focus on lamb saving lambs and lamb survival. And that's really the, the basis behind all of the low labor system is that we want to be able to do things like watering, uh, feeding, bedding our sheep with the least amount of labor so that so we can use our labor uh, where it's going to pay us the greatest dividends, which is uh, saving lambs and managing newborn lambs. Uh, in terms of easy bedding systems, uh, th this is one uh, idea. Uh, these are lambing pens that are um, basically on expanded metal flooring. And if you look at the flooring, that's a woven hog, uh, used hog flooring in this particular one. Uh, the cedar is on, or lambing pens are on skids, and so we can 
pull it into the lambing barn and set them up. Um, these and and when the ewes are in these lambing pens, it requires no bedding, uh, and uh, we have a water tube as is shown here. And in many of these now, uh, they have also are self-feeding soy hulls and, and DDGs uh, or alfalfa pellets, and, and therefore, uh, when once the ewe is in here, the only thing they need to be doing with the ewe is to make sure that. The lambs are nursed up, that the mom and lambs are bonding together, and that it gives them the opportunity to process the lambs uh, before they head out into the, the grouping pens. And so uh, this is uh, just another look at it. These are uh, in sections that fit back to back. Uh, this particular flooring, I think, is also woven hog flooring, but expanded metal uh, flooring uh, definitely works uh, very well in these pens as well. And it's one way to eliminate bedding. Uh, we don't have to bed. We, if we set them up right, we don't have to bed. We don't have to feed. We don't have to water uh, on a daily basis and therefore can focus on uh, the most important thing at hand. So uh, once we get into a lambing barn then, uh, our job is basically getting used lambed out, get them in the lambing pens, get the lambs bonded and processed, uh, and then be able to move them out and start to make larger groups of pairs. Uh, in our operation. And the, the, again, the goal or the end result is that we want to save more lambs, uh, make our operations more profitable, and have more lambs available to the industry uh, as part of the Let's Grow program. Uh, some other things just to throw in that help make lambing barns easier or help make sheep management period uh, easier uh, are having walk-through gates uh, wherever we can possibly get them. Uh, this particular picture, you see the arrow. Um, these are uh, uh, swinging gates for lambing pens, so that we uh, we aren't having to crawl over a lambing pen to check on lambs. Uh, we aren't having to, uh, to unfasten uh, lambing gates to swing them open to put ewes in or to get them back out. And this particular gate, uh, if you look right where the arrow is at, there's kind of a two little metal uh, pieces that come down to make a U shape. And that gate, when you swing it over, you lift it up. This gate will lift up just a little bit, and it sets right over this metal bar here, and that's the latch on it. And so it's a really a simple gate to use, and it allows you to, to get used quickly in and out of lambing pens. It allows you as a person to, to, to go into the pen and, and, and help a lamb or to check on the lambs to see if they're nursed up. Uh, so it, it just uh, makes it much easier uh, for us to carry out the tasks we need to in the lambing barn. And the, the, the slide on the right uh, just shows another walk gate here that allows us to get from pen to pen uh, very easily. Uh, and when we can do things easy, uh, we tend to get them done in a timely fashion, which is, I think, one of the critical things to being successful. Uh, with that, I want to just go into looking at the floor plan or layout of some barns. And, and like I mentioned earlier, each one of you has your own buildings, your own unique uh, uh, situation. Uh, hopefully, everything that we've talked about gives you an idea or two that you can uh, you can apply to your operation. And so, I, I want to just look at some uh, some floor plans that uh, we've we've had producers use in their lambing barns and, and kind of tell you how we use them. Uh, this is a floor plan basically for a, a narrow building um, and. Uh, and by narrow building, I'm talking buildings that are 40 foot wide, 45 foot wide or less. I mean, they're they're narrow, uh, which in those cases, as you can see, we have lambing pens along the outside wall. Uh, in our cold climate, that may not be ideal uh, because the coldest part in the barn is right along the cold outside wall. But in a narrow barn, uh, if we tried to put lambing pens back to back down the middle, which I'll show you in a little bit, we simply don't have a a wide enough space for use to move around on the outside. And so on narrow buildings, we need to put our lambing pens along the outside walls. Um, it's just more efficient. You can see the blue line here shows a water tube. And the green line shows our uh, dividing gates for our drop pens. This happens to be a barn that's built for 100 to 125 head of use. I mean, it, you, if you build it longer, it, it, uh, 
you know, you just put more use in it. But what we try to do as part of low labor is that we have what we have went to eliminating night checking our use. Um, uh, we check our use generally at 10, 11 at night, and again at 6, 7 in the morning. And when we really sat down and said, well, why do we night check? One of the major reasons was is that we were worried about mismothering. In other words, having four coming out in the morning and having four or five ewes all lamb with their lambs all together, uh, some ewes wanting all the lambs and, uh, and other ewes that didn't want any of them, and it just made a mess for us. And so one of the things that we've done in our lambing barns, and all our lambing barns have that, is that when we let our ewes outside generally to eat in the daytime, uh, and when we bring them back in, we bring them back in and we divide them into small drop groups, and that's what each of these pens are. So if there were 100 ewes in this group, when we bring them back into the barn, uh, we put 25 in this pen, 25 in the next pen, 25 and 25. And so that'll, that reduces the odds of more than one or two ewes lambing uh, in each one of these drop pens while we are sleeping at night um, and so when we come out in the morning we have just a lot less mismothering problems and the other thing it does it gets the ewes uh, spread through the sheds so no matter where a ewe lambs uh, we have a short distance to a lambing pen and you heard Philip talk earlier in this web webinar that uh, we have the short distance principle and that's that's definitely a key thing uh, in terms of uh, moving ewes and lambs around particularly ewes that have just lambed and have a newborn lamb and when we leave the lambing pen and that lamb experiences a bigger world for the first time uh, boy they're really hard to move and so we want to be moving them short distances which simply make it easier for us and so if a ewe lambs in you know in this spot in, in a lambing pen where my arrow is at here uh, it's you know it's a short distance relatively short distance to any of the lambing pens that are here and then as we lamb in this particular barn, as we get our lambing pens kind of filled up, uh, when the ewes are turned out that have not lambed yet to eat for the day, uh, we empty lambing pens and we start backfilling this last drop pen becomes a grouping pen. Uh, and so we'll move uh, you know, 10 to 15 ewes with lambs aside into one of these pens because we have fewer ewes now to lamb and they can fit in these three pens. So, that's, that's a little bit of our philosophy, uh, and, and this is kind of how we set up uh, narrow buildings. Here's another floor plan or look at how we would set up a, a narrow building. We have a producer that um, basically uh, he has this is all drop area for his use, and then as they lamb, he moves them uh, through a gate into these lambing pens that are shown here again with a water tube. And then when he leaves the lambing pens and puts them into grouping pens, uh, he exits through this door here and actually groups the ewes and lambs in, an, in another building. Uh, that may not, that gets to be kind of a long move. That's longer than what we'd find ideal. But for his barn and for the other barns he has, this, this ends up being the best floor plan for him. And so the flow is that they drop here, they move to lambing pens, and then they move into another building for grouping and and getting them into larger groups. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, sophisticated uh, look at, but again it, it shows a, a, a concept of kind of our newer state-of-the-art lambing barns that have been built in the last five, six years. Uh, and uh, this particular barn uh, is designed uh, that when the barn is filled, uh, all of these pens you see around the outside are all drop pens. So if a ewe lambs in here, we're going to take her out of the gate and put her in a lambing pen here. If she lambs over here, she's going to come out and go into one of these lambing pens. Uh, so once we've kind of got the lambing pens full, then, then when we go to group, uh, we end up taking them out of the lambing pens, run them down the alleyway, and make this into a grouping pen in this particular barn. And uh, so it's a short distance again. You know, if a ewe... Uh, you know, lambs here, we pen her here, when she leaves she goes into a grouping pen here. Uh, it's pretty easy to move her the short distance that we have to and so it takes very little time. And this particular operation just started, this becomes the first grouping pen, the next grouping pen is this one, this one, and as they, as they lamb out use, they turn all of these what used to be small drop pens into grouping pens and when they're all done lambing, this will be the last pen filled, 
Then they, they move all these ewes and lambs to another uh, building, the cold housing building, and they reload this building uh, with more ewes that are in their next group to lamb. Now these new lambing barns uh, feature a workroom or an office area, whatever you want to call it, where we it's warm. Uh, we have hot water there. We have a refrigerator with our uh, medicines and supplies we need at lambing time. Uh, we've got uh, all of our all of our lambing time supplies here, and so it's uh, we aren't running to the house to mix up milk replacer. Uh, we are if we have a sick lamb. The medicine's right here, and so it's easy to respond to things that we need to very quickly uh, if, if we have all of that located here in this particular barn. As Phillips mentioned earlier, that we need to decide where our milk replacer, our model lambs, our artificially reared lambs are. This particular barn, this is the place they train the milk replacer lambs. Uh, this happens to be a floor plan from an operation that drops about 225% lamb crop. And so they have a lot of milk replacer lambs. And you'll notice that it's right on the pathway between the warm office area and checking these lambing pens and checking these uh, drop pens. And so they're walking back and forth by that pen. And so it's simple to stop, make, get a lamb up on the nipple, uh, make sure that it's, it's nursing on the milk replacer uh, system we have and that it's trained. And so we can observe those lambs. Uh, much easier and we're walking by it all the time and so it's easy to train those lambs. So that, that's kind of a, a floor plan of our, some of our newer state-of-the-art buildings which are for our climate are, are fully insulated, uh, warm buildings. Uh, actually we work harder at keeping it cool, cool enough in the buildings than we do at, at keeping it warm. Another uh, sample layout uh, in the last couple minutes I have here, this would be a wider barn now. Uh, these are barns that are uh, uh, 45 to 50 feet wide as a minimum. And then we put lambing pens down the middle. Uh, again, a one water tube. Water's lambing pens on both sides. And then all of these are drop pens around the outside. And so again, a short distance from if a ewe lambs here, it's a short distance to get her to a lambing pen. If she lambs here, it's a short distance to a lambing pen. And so that's that short distance principle. And then when these ewes are let out, kind of one pen at a time to go out to eat, because uh, most of our dropping ewes that have not lambed yet, uh, we feed outside in this, this climate, uh, and I think most everywhere that I've, I've traveled in the United States. Uh, when they're outside, then we are emptying lambing pens and starting to make these into grouping pens. Um, and so, again, all the short distance moving again. I mean, if, if uh, if a ewe is in a lambing pen here, it's a relatively short distance to take her out and move her through these open gates and make this uh, grouping pen here. And so short distance from drop to, uh, to the lambing pen to our grouping pens, and then from the grouping pens we intend to move them into bigger bunches and move them on. Uh, this is just another example of a flow-through barn. Um, Actually, a few of these are used out west as lambing sheds, uh, some of them in the Midwest. And, and these uh, tend to have a big drop area, which is this area here. The ewes drop. Uh, they're moved into these lambing pens. And then when they come out of the lambing pens, they move into a grouping pen. And each, uh, uh, this particular model, I think, is a, a, opera, a barn that's kind of set up to run about 300 to 350 ewes through it at one time. And so, the ewes drop, they move into these lambing pens. There's six lambing pens here and six here with an alleyway. Uh, and when it's time to empty these pens, uh, this grouping pen will hold 12 ewes with lambs inside. And then when after the ewes and lambs have been in this grouping pen for a day or two days, depending on, on pressure of ewes lambing, uh, they go out they go out the door to either another building or in the range operation they go out and start to be bunched up or grouped up into range bands. Um, some might be single, some might be twins. So it's a flow through barn. Again, they drop, they move to lambing pens, they move to a grouping pen, and then they head on out the door to either other, other buildings or to uh, be put together for range groups. So that gives you a, a rough idea of, of uh, some, some floor plans. Uh, again, uh, you have to work with the buildings that you have. Uh, and, and so hopefully there's an idea or two there that will help, uh, help you uh, lay out your, your, 
lambing facility so that uh, so the flow of the sheep uh, works with you. So you're kind of working with the sheep and, and it's easy to move them, which then allows you to have more time to focus on what's important, which is saving lambs. Uh, with that, uh, um, that concludes my talk. Uh, and uh, Jay, I guess uh, we're ready to answer questions if there are some. Okay, very good. And there are some questions, Mike. Um, once again, you guys can an ask questions of our speakers uh, by typing questions into your question box or by raising your hand. And if you haven't found that little hand icon, it should be up on your uh, control panel up towards the top left. And uh, if you currently don't have your hand up, it'll have a little blue arrow pointing up, meaning when you click it, your hand goes up in the air. And I can see that on my end. Um, let me go ahead and um, pick off some questions that came in earlier uh, when Philip was talking. And uh, Philip, you want to go ahead and unmute your microphone and I'll, there we go. Um, we had some questions come in about freezing, um, you know, with the water in the tubes, uh, specifically how do you keep the water from freezing in those tubes? And I think um, they'd also like you to expand on, you know, how easy those are to clean out if they do freeze compared to other watering methods. Uh, for the most part, um, we're, we're setting up the barns so that they stay above freezing, and so we see very little problems. Probably the biggest place that we've seen a problem um, is that if they're on the outside wall, and that's a colder wall, uh, that would be the, the place that we have uh, slight problems with the freezing. But for the most part, we're designing the building so that they stay uh, warm enough um, that, that we're not going to have water being frozen there. And most of the time, the ewes themselves will provide enough heat in the well-insulated building. Um, under real extreme temperatures, we do have heaters that run or can run, uh, but most of the time, uh, the ewes themselves uh, will provide enough heat um, to keep the, the, if we have it insulated enough, to keep the water from freezing. How hard is it to clean? Um, for the most part, uh, positioning so that the feeders, we want to make sure that we position the feeders so that that, um, that they don't defecate into the into the water tube and so that's an initial step that we want to uh, move, move those feeders around so that that's not an issue uh, but if they do get contaminated and they do once in a while for the most part they're fairly easily to clean out we remove that plug on the end um, and the water will come out um, I would say we've got some producers that probably don't clean, don't have to clean their waters uh, more than once every group, um, and they probably clean it between groups. Um, and uh, so but very little problems with the contamination, and it's fairly easily done by just screwing off the end cap. Okay, very nice. Um, Go ahead. I, I'll just add one more tip. Uh, if you happen to have a barn that is a little cold and and there's a tendency of the water to, to freeze in it. Uh, some people, depending on how long your water tube is, uh, some people have had really good success uh, using a little bird bath uh, heaters uh, and just submerge them in one end of the, the water tube or in the middle and it warms the water enough so that it, it takes the edge off and it doesn't freeze. So uh, if, if you're in a situation where uh, when it gets real cold, uh, you're, it can freeze a little bit in those water tubes, uh, that's a uh, a cheap, uh, handy way to uh, to uh, kind of keep the water temp war just warm enough so that it doesn't freeze. Okay, and uh, Loris asked a very practical question about the H supports that you were showing. Uh, specifically, how far apart do you recommend putting those H supports in the water pipe? There, you would want them far enough so that you can fit your six-inch um, tube in there and just so that it kind of straddles in there. You don't want it too too wide. You want it so that it's almost touching the edges so that it helps to maintain the, the, the water tube itself. Okay, and then the spacing between, you know, one H support and another. Oh, um, that spacing, I guess I'm not real sure. The one is probably, the wooden one that I showed you the picture of at first was probably four and a half um, feet between those. Um, you probably could most of them are probably at four to five feet um, mm -hmm. that are put up because that's a, the size of the lambing jug. Okay. The lambing pen. 
Okay, we have several people with their hands up, so I'm going to go ahead and call on uh, one of them now. Dave Scott, I see you out there with your hand up. I'm going to unmute your microphone. Dave, are you there? Dave, are you there? Uh, apparently he's not there. Let me try one other person here. Barbara, uh, Barbara Glunn, I see you out there. Um, let me unmute your microphone. Barbara, are you there? Well, I'm not Barbara. I'm Jeff, but I, okay. I work with Barbara. Okay. I'm, I'm curious. I have Cheviots, okay, and I don't know how big the tube opening should be for their faces to get in to drink the water. I mean, I, I've seen the pictures, and it's great, and I really like the concept, so I think I'm going to do that. How big should the opening be for them to get their face in to drink the water? I guess um, I'd be looking, starting off with, um, you can always make them bigger. You can never make them smaller. But I would start off with probably a, a, a two, probably a three inch, three, three and a half inches by about six inches. And what size pipe do you recommend? You, you've you been saying six inch, but I, I it looks like most of the pictures are eight inch. So I'm curious. Those, more, all those are six inch pipes that were six inch diameter pipes. So if I made a caveat in there for three inches, that would be good enough bite, but how wide should it be? Well, I would make it going horizontally. I would The horizontal length, I would probably make it um, about six inches. Perfect. That's what I need to know. That's great. And, I, and you guys are great, and I love this webinar. So I, I've got some really good ideas. Thank you. Uh, we have a question submitted uh, to the question box here from Steve on uh, how he worded it as how many pens are recommended per you, but I think he's just wondering, you know, in terms of the lambing jugs and the pens that you have there, uh, do you have any uh, simple rules of thumbs in terms of how many pens they should have there based off of how many ewes they're running through the system? Well, I... I Basically, we try to, the rule of thumb we use is one lambing pen for every 15 ewes. Um, so, you know, some of that's going to depend on how fast and how big a group. Uh, you know, if we have some people nowadays that are synchronized and are used to all be in heat at the same time, and obviously we need a lot more lambing pens if we're doing that. But breeding them naturally, um, um, one lambing pen for every 15 ewes or 15%. We need lambing pens at number 15% of the total we're going to lamb. So if you're lambing 100 ewes, you need 15 lambing pens. And and that that generally is adequate as long as sheep are flowing through the lambing pens and we don't have a lot of problems filling up lambing pens. We would, we would set up, as Mike indicated, 15% in the permanent format like we have displayed today or like Mike showed on the... Um, Show it on the diagrams, layout diagrams, but then the, for those peak time periods, they're going to have supplemental lambing jugs that they will put up other places. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, we had a question come in from Richard about, uh, he's wondering, have you done any work or set any lambing pin systems similar to what Premier is, has been doing? Uh, yes, we have some producers that uh, I'm not sure exactly which uh, what, what the question is, so Premier tried a new concept this year, and we don't have anybody using that concept of, of putting ewes in the lambing pens prior to lambing like you would a, a sow into a farrowing crate. Uh, we, we don't have anybody using that concept. I know Premier experimented with that this year and had good success, but we do have producers using the Premier panels. Uh, the uh, that, he, that they sell uh, using those as lambing pens, and the and producers that have those really like them. They're, they're, they're good lamb, they make a good lambing pen. So okay. hopefully I've answered that question. Yeah, a quick follow-up on that from Mark that's related. He asked, um, let's see, in our very small operation, is there an advantage to pinning the animal before the lamb drops, which I think is what you were talking about a little bit there with the Premier system. Do you see an advantage to doing that? As a general rule, uh, we see a, a disadvantage to doing that just from the standpoint that sheep uh, tend to like to flock with other sheep, and, and sometimes we put them in the lambing pens uh, prior to lambing, and they're there for, for several days, 
Uh, a lot of times our ewes will get what we call a lambing pen stale. They, they start to lose their appetite. They don't eat like they should. And so uh, I, I know that Premier got along well with that concept last year, but they had all the ewes synchronized. Uh, so they, they knew when they put them in the pens they were going to be lambing within uh, three or four days. Uh, generally, our lambing pens are enough of a premium that we're, we're wanting to reserve those pens for, uh, for ewes that have just lambed and, and move them through that way. Plus, it reduces the amount of buildup of manure in the pens. Um, uh, if we put ewes in there prior to lambing, we, have, we just have a lot more manure buildup and more disease problems. So as a general rule, we, we don't like doing that. We like the ewes being able to go outside to eat. Um, and uh, and move around some. Uh, it seems like we have a, a less trouble with lambing, a less trouble or an easier time keeping ewes on feed and keeping them eating good. Okay. And Mark also asked a nutrition question. Uh, what percent of protein in alfalfa pellets as a substitute for soy hole pellets and DBGs? Uh, in in the lambing in the lambing pens. Um, you know, generally alfalfa pellets come as either 15 or 17 percent protein. Uh, probably either one of them are going to work just fine in lambing pens. If you are intending to sell feed them to use for the first 30 days of lactation, I would want to be on the 17 percent uh, protein alfalfa pellets. Okay. And Jerry asks, how do you feed minerals in the lambing jugs? Um, we don't. Um, uh, the only minerals we feed are trace mineral uh, salt uh, to our use. Generally the rations that we're on are, are very adequate in calcium and phosphorus, so we don't feed any other mineral except uh, trace mineral salt. Our use are on that prior to going into the uh, lambing pens, and again, we're trying to get them out of the lambing pens in 24 to 48 hours, and so there's really no reason for them to have uh, any mineral for that, uh, that short period of time. Uh, then they're back onto a trace mineral salt uh, mix when we put them into grouping pens. Okay. Um, Christy and RJ asked, uh, how long uh, to the use for staying in the lambing pens before moving them to the grouping pens? Um, we, we, like to, we like to move them out in 24 hours to, to 48. Uh, uh, if, if, if everything's going well, uh, and by going well, the lamb is strong and healthy, and it's gotten up, and it's nursing mom, and mom loves the lamb. Uh, we'll, we'll try to move them out of the pen in 24 hours uh, from when they're born, uh, and, and for sure want them out of there in 48. Now, if we have problems, you know, um, weak lambs or the ewe doesn't want to own the lamb, obviously we're going to keep the ewe and lamb in the lambing pen until we solve that problem. But uh, again, we, we run into problems uh, if we leave ewes and lambing pens too long. It seems like they start to lose their appetite and don't eat like they should. Uh, and they start to get a little stir crazy, depending a little on the genetics. And so uh, we're, we kind of like to get them moved on out of the lambing pens and get them into those uh, 10 to 15 head grouping pens is, uh, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. Okay. And Loris has her hand up, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, Loris. Um, would like to ask a question. Are you there, Loris? Actually, Loris is my husband. I'm another one of those fill-ins. Okay. Well, you, can, you can ask it anonymously then. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> go ahead. Um, we, move, we move our use out of the jugs and into a larger barn that has three pens where we have about 25 use in the lambs with a creep area outside or away from that. We had quite a bit of trouble with uh, Coxie this last year and so we're in the debate of moving our feeding and hay outside and opening the barn letting them use out. Any thoughts on that? Instead of feeding them inside because we have feed bunks running down the middle of the three pens and throw the feed and the hay in there. So we're thinking about moving outside with it. Well, uh that's a, that's a good question, and you know, I, uh, basically, coccidiosis is is uh, is carried by all mature sheep and and passed on uh, to the next generation, and 
and so if we're having a problem, we have to look at uh, are, are we keeping the pens well bedded enough? Are we keeping the water clean? And if we're doing those things and still have a problem, then we really need to be probably looking at uh, feeding a coccidiostat ahead of lambing time to the ewes to knock the level of coccidiosis down in the ewes. Now, Philip and I aren't veterinarians. Um, uh, you know, I'm just speaking from uh, experience with producers that we work with, but uh, I don't. Uh, Generally, you know, just moving your feeding outside it isn't going to really change that issue. Now, the lambs are likely picking up the coccidiosis by sucking on a nipple that's got coccidiosis on it from the ewe laying in the manure or um, something like that. Uh, and so, it's it's a I understand it's a big problem, um, and so, you know. There are. I don't. I don't think move, moving to outside feeding is necessarily going to solve that. I think you may have to look at other things like feeding a coccidiostat to the ewes prior to lambing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much we for that just, question. Well, we just thought maybe uh, we noticed that there, with feeding the hay inside, that there seemed to be a lot more accumulation of manure around the hay, and we wondered if we put the hay outside, if that would, have, you know, get the ewes outside a little bit more. But yeah. Well, it, it it sure gonna it sure will help uh, to spread you know to spread the manure out over a bigger area. It's going to reduce exposure, and so but it's still there. Yeah. It's still going to be there. Uh, again, you know, mature sheep and actually once they're exposed to it and build immunity, sheep uh, sheep are resistant to coccidiosis once they've been through their initial exposure. It's uh, the problem is when that initial exposure comes in a baby lamb or young lamb. Uh, really raises heck with them, and that, uh, and so, so we know our mature ewes are all carrying coccidiosis naturally and normally in their gut, um, and they're going to be spreading it through their manure and stuff. So, yeah, if you can spread the manure out, uh, you know, have them eating over a bigger area and giving them more space, it'll, it'll reduce exposure, uh, but I don't think it'll eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we got several questions coming in about cleaning, so I want to try to get to those before we close here. Um, Julia asks, how do you manage all the bedding material in the drop areas during lambing period, and what do you do with it all at the end of the season? And Mark asked a related question, which was asking for suggestions for bedding material. So could you address the bedding material situation? Um, sure. Uh, basically, we bed with, uh, with straw. Uh, you know, wheat straw, oat straw, you know, whatever kind of straw we have, and or corn stalks. Um, we're in a big corn producing area, and so we have a lot of corn stalks available, and so some of our operations use corn stalks. And uh, we, when the minute our, when our bedding starts to get a little bit damp, uh, we, we put fresh bedding down. And our, most of our producers lamb three to four groups of ewes through their lambing barn, and they try to clean all the manure out of the lambing barn between groups. Um, and so we, we just clean it out, we stockpile it, and it starts to compost. And, um, and, and so that's, that's kind of how we handle it. We're always making sure we have a dry, uh, our bedding is dry. And so whenever it starts looking a little wet and damp, we're putting fresh bedding down. Uh, to keep it dry. Okay. And Sarah asked, uh, related, do you have any recommendations for reducing pen cleaning labor? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we basically don't. <laughs> we don't <laughs> clean lambing pens. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that's necessarily ideal, but it's just one of those things that lambing time when you're trying to large, lamb large numbers of sheep uh, that we just don't have time for. Uh, now, the, the expanded metal floor lambing pens uh, have been some producers' answer to, to how we keep clean lambing pens. You know, when we have them on expanded metal, uh, all the manure and urine goes down below the, the flooring, and so uh, it's not an issue. There's nothing to clean out except to maybe pick up placentas that, because they don't tend to go through the expanded metal very well. But um, our folks that are on a manure pack system, uh, they're they're bedding the lambing pens between after you, you know, as soon as they get a little bit damp, 
and between ewes, when one ewe leaves, they'll bed it before the next ewe goes in. And so we're adding fresh bedding and bedding on top of the old manure that's there. And, and, um, uh, and we, we don't have anybody that's cleaning out lambing pens between ewes anymore. Uh, just because we're running so many sheep, we just don't have time to do it. Okay. And Lily asked about disinfectant. Uh, she said, what are you using for disinfectant a for after cleaning the jugs and drying them out? Um, if, you're gonna, if you're cleaning out the jugs, uh, uh, barn lime, putting some barn lime down uh, in, the, in the, the freshly cleaned out pen helps dry it up a little bit and... Uh, Basically, if you got, have a cement floor, you could just mix bleach and water and spray the cement floor uh, after you clean it out. Uh, that would be a, a, the cheapest disinfectant. If you have a dirt floor, no other disinfectant is going to work on dirt. Uh, basically, uh, dirt foreign material neutralizes almost all the disinfectants. And so air, air is our air and drying out. Um, bacteria doesn't live in in uh, open air and, and in a dry environment. So if we can, whatever we can do to dry up the floor of that lambing pen after the manure is cleaned out will help reduce bacteria. Okay, and one last question on that. Jerry asked a follow-up question on the picking up placentas. He says, can you simply cover them with fresh bedding instead of picking them up? Uh, for the that? most part, that's for the most part, that's what most of our producers do is just bed over them. Um, you know, some use eat placenta, and, uh, but for the most part, we're just bedding over the placentas if the ewes don't eat them. Okay. Uh, now, on the expanded metal floor, we, we need to pick them up because they don't go through the floor. Okay. And if we leave them there, we don't have enough foot action or foot traffic to push them uh, through the floor and to tear them up, and so we need to remove them from those pens. But other than that, we don't remove them. Okay, very good. And Lana, you have your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Lana, are you there? Lana, are you there? Okay, I'm not hearing her. Um, so let's see. Um, somebody asked, when, uh, when do you give C, D, and T to the lambs? Well, we're we're get, we're getting over into the health side, and I've already gave the disclaimer that we're that we're not veterinarians, but I can tell you what we do. <laughs> uh, we we vaccinate we vaccinate our ewes a couple weeks prior to them lambing, and we count on, in the case of C and D, we count on them passing antibodies on through their colostrum to their lambs, uh, and that will protect the lambs until they're about three to four weeks of age, and then we want to be giving vaccinating the lambs for C and D at that point in time. Um, there's a lot of different stories on, on tetanus out there, which is the T part of that vaccine. Basically, all the research that's been done shows that if we vaccinate ewes, they pass along zero antibodies to their lambs for tetanus. And so if we are worried about tetanus in our lambs, we have to be vaccinating lambs. Uh, at the time that we process them, when they're 24 to 48 hours old, uh, we are taking preventative action uh, for tetanus uh, in the lamb itself. Um, so, that you know, for the most part, we don't have tetanus problems when the sheep aren't exposed to dirt, and so uh, we're more worried about type C uh, enterotoxemia, and so we're vaccinating the use prior to lambing. But if you have a tetanus problem, uh, you really need to work with your veterinarian. Um, and uh, and develop a plan on how you how you uh, protect the lamb against tetanus. Okay, we have time for uh, one more question here, and this is from Mark. He says, "Are your grouping pens in a heated area or above freezing?" In reference to getting the ewe and the lamb out of the lambing pens and into the grouping pens, is there a, you know a big rule of thumb there in terms of keeping those at the same temperature or not making that too drastic of a difference, et cetera? If, if, we're, uh, if we're moving lambs out of the lambing pens uh, 24 to 48 hours old, uh, we would ideally like to have them in, a, in the same relatively warm environment. Now, many of our operations move them from lambing pens to a cold environment, and so we have to watch the weather. 
that's why the one floor plan I said, you know, we, we keep them in the grouping pens for 24 hours. If the weather's bad, it might be 48 uh, or as long as we can. I, I think uh, lambs don't develop uh, a good thermoregulatory system where they can control their body temperature until they're three days old. Uh, and I think that's just important to remember that. So whatever environment you put them in, they're going to produce some body heat, but they don't have, until they're three days old, they don't have a, a, a real well-developed ability to control their body heat. And so if you put them in a real cold environment, they're going to they're going to lose too much body heat and we set them back or we chill them down or they start starving out. So in an ideal world, we want to leave the lambing pen, which is a relatively warm environment, and have them in a grouping pen uh, that's also in a relatively warm environment. If, if that's ideal. Now, again, not every operation is able to do that. And so we watch the weatherman at night, and if he's saying it's going to be 20 below tomorrow, and we got to move them to a cold building, we just simply find a way not to move them out to the cold building until it's a little warmer. Okay, very good. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, draw things to a close. We're at quarter after the hour. Um, once again, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending tonight. We had very strong attendance, and, and uh, pretty much everybody hung in all the way to the end and asked some really good questions. I also want to thank, again, the American Sheep Industry Association Rebuild the Sheep Inventory Committee for providing funding for the program and encourage all of you out there to visit their website at growourflock.org, where they have a, a number of different resources for you, including links and information on all of our webinars. Um, all of you out there that attended tonight and registered for this event will receive a follow-up email in the next uh, 48 hours with a uh, link and information on how to access the recording. Um, and uh, so look in your inbox uh, for that. And uh, I'd like to just close with a big thank you to uh, Philip and Mike for a very good presentation. And um, encourage all you guys to check out their program up there at Pipestone. Uh, I know they've uh, done a lot of education over the years, and we're very pleased to uh, be able to uh, get a moment of their time to come on and uh, share this with you guys uh, on a national basis. So, Philip and Mike, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and draw this to a close. And uh, once again, thanks, everybody, uh, for their attendance.